recorded today just so that we have the record of it. We might end up posting on our YouTube um, channel. Um, but I'm going to post on the chat as well so that no one will be thrown off if they come in later. Um, we also have some classes coming up for the first time ever in the summer. We're doing a full summer session. Um, if you're interested in checking those out, you can just go to our website, which I'm going to um, drop into the chat as well. Um, but Liz, I'll let you take it over from here on out. I'm really glad that everyone's able to join us today. Great. All right. Hello. Um, welcome. Thanks for coming out. Um, I'm Liz, and um, we are going to do a few things today. We're, the session is about cities and stories. Um, we're going to be reading a short piece about cities and stories. We're going to talk about it a bit, and then we're going to be writing our own work, um, thinking about specifically how to bring city spaces um, to life vibrantly on the page. And the, we're going to beginning um, with a piece um, by John Edgar Wideman. There's a link in the chat. Right now it was published um, two years ago in the New Yorker. If you aren't familiar with John Edgar Wideman, he's um, a novelist and short story, short story writer um, native to Pittsburgh, but he lived in Philly for a number of years and wrote, has written about Philly. Um, he has a new book of short stories out just now at the age of 80. He's a pretty um, phenomenal writer and has a fascinating life. So um, I recommend exploring his work. Um, so why don't, what I'd like to do just to get us going um, is to read this and for us to read this aloud. Um, if I could have seven volunteers, there are seven paragraphs um, that constitute this piece. Um, do I have seven individuals willing to read one of those paragraphs? If you can signal um, through either raise your hand or um, give me a sign and I will. Um, and all right. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna... willing, but I can't, it doesn't seem to, the story isn't coming up. So maybe oh, that's our people. Okay, I will put the story on my screen as well. Okay. I'll share it so we can I could all read. I have the link and then I went to my New Yorker link and that doesn't. Okay, that, that makes sense. I'm gonna share it. So let's just okay. get, so I'm gonna write our names I need in order so that we have a list here on the side of how we can go. Okay, who else do I have here? I have Anne, um, Thatcher. Sorry if I'm missing people as they, you can feel free to yell out <laughs> if you want to. Anne Thatcher, who's next? Sarah. And do we have one more, Alyssa? And if I'm pronouncing your name wrong, I apologize. Um, one more, I need three more. I can be one of them. Okay, Fern, thank you. And Emily, thank you. Number five, you'll see it's a little bit of a doozy. So prepare yourself. <laughs> um, but thank you. All right. So I'm going to now, and anyone else want to read or I'll go, I'll be number seven. Okay. Um, okay. As we, before we begin, um, there are a few things going on in the short piece. Um, we can discuss them all afterwards. What I'd like you to do as we read is to identify one or two sentences in the piece that strike you um, as particularly sharp, um, particularly um, resonant or vibrant in some way. And that's all, and, and we'll come and talk about them. If you'd like to post them in the chat as we go, you can do that, or you can just hold on to them. Um, all right, now I'm going to bring up and share my screen so that we can all read the piece. Uh, all right, let's see if we can do this. All right, does everyone see the New Yorker screen? Mm -hmm. All right, great. Okay, so we will begin. I'm gonna hand it over um, to Anne to get us started and I'll scroll as we go. Two young people different colors, my color, pass me, 
crown of her top knot, edge of his, edges of his fro glow softly above their heads. When I first glanced down the street and noticed the couple busy with each other, stride synced, not hurrying, not strolling either, about a half a block away, walking towards me on grand, the glow hovered, visible against early morning light of a clear spring day, framing the figures as they approached closer, pavement shadowy under their feet, sky behind them stretching up and up into bluish than pale cloudless distance. A sky finally no color, all color, same, different as the glow I'd seen floating atop their heads. Stories are graves, <laughs> empty, nothing there. All living and dying in them, fake, pretend. No story unless someone reads, tells it, empty. No one's time inside a story, time needed to live and die to tell stories. But stories, not time, stories, graves. No entering or leaving them without time, nothing breathing inside them, lost nor found, no time, only stories only words, pretend words, pretend time. Pretend to enter, to leave, to begin. Make yourself believe you create time, are time, contained by time, contain time. As if time not a story you make up, believe. As if time not a word like others you make up to tell a story. Once upon a time, as if time might end or begin. As if time waits in a story or is something like stories. As if a story contains time or is contained by time. As if time stops or leaves or catches up or begins in stories. As if words tell time and time listens or reads as if stories are not graves, where we play dead, play with the dead. As if the something words make of nothing is time, more time, somewhere. Time and not a story, not fiction, not a grave. Make someone believe somewhere, something saved by telling, listening, reading. A tangible somewhere in time, something that might accumulate, count. More time, more than time. Not nothing, words, stories, more. Perhaps I tell myself I have no one to tell, to listen to, to read. A story does not become something until it ends, until I pretend it's over and that I am no longer experiencing a walk on Grand Street early in the morning. Pretend these words one after the other are something like steps mine, yours, anybody's, anyone who listens, reads for some reason and perhaps may remember steps, streets, and revisits how a morning materializes from nothing, but step after step taken while darkness, brightness unfold and enfold, nothing until you are feeling, speaking one instant, one word after another, the next seeming to follow the one before. No beginning or end, more steps, more streets seeming maybe never to stop, materializing as fast and as solid as missing things, suddenly recalled, things striking you as happy, painful, familiar, odd, urgent. Though soon enough, you also recall that nothing's there. You are alone as always with your thoughts, always alone, even with a busy head full of them, including anybody else's thoughts, aches, telling stories, pretending time at your fingertips, time ahead as you take step after step along grand. And where, oh, where else could you be? Where are you headed this morning, if not to a physical therapy appointment at 450 Grand Street and two young people appear together, content, focused enough on each other to match strides, colored teenagers or very young adults coming toward you, crowns of soft light outlining hair rising above their skulls, 
light visible against morning's brightness, a shimmering that perhaps is source or end or both a vast brightness above them, surrounding them. But when I glance up and notice them, the word morning somehow came to mind. Morning's sadness and that morning word mine, yours, the morning mine, yours, but only one, only once and anyway belongs to no one, belongs, fits nowhere, is nothing except word, story, nothing, nowhere, only a story beginning you might find yourself in the midst of unexpectedly. But of course, an empty story, over and dead, a true story since they are all true and are not when you tell them. Listen, read. Listen, I want to pretend to believe the glow, the aura is seeping from or hovering above the heads of two young people on a Lower East Side Street in New York City, USA, April 29th, 2018, signify hope eternal and that light above them is the same immense light I saw framing serried row after row of people not stretching to the horizon, but rows backed up at least as far as where towers, stores, windows, and walls of city resumed. Even the last row of shimmering crowns ablaze, maybe about to ignite the square and monumental buildings of stone enclosing them, tops of heads glowing, perhaps ready to explode and incinerate the million or so fuzzy bodies indistinguishable from one another of a crowd that had gathered to greet Nelson Mandela coming home after 27 years of imprisonment, a crowd whose size, whose hope ungraspable through my visitor's eyes were present, hungry witnesses peering down from Cape Castle's balcony on February 11th, 1990 in Cape Town, Republic of South Africa. Inextinguishable hope, one story I can imagine, maybe tell, even if a different story narrated by helicopter gunships stitching a dark net in air above the square, barricades fortified by tanks and steel rhinos packed with shock troops in camouflage that secured all streets, every entrance and exit from the space of welcoming. Time unruffled by stops and starts, entrances, exits, stories. Two young people pass me, Grand Street unruffled as time going nowhere, my steps one after another, vanishing, past two young colored strangers. Remember the square in Cape Town, the teeming excited crowd in which maybe I last saw them. Okay, um, thank you to our readers. Um, I am going to see, stop our share so we can come back. Um, I want to hear um, from you uh, which sentences captured your attention as we read. Let's begin that way. Yeah, Sarah, we can. Um, I liked the two. I don't know that I caught all of them, but in paragraph five, uh, the first one, how a morning materializes from nothing. And then a little bit later, um, materializing as fast and as solid as missing things. Hmm. I like the use of the, the way the, I love the way he echoes words in this and repeats and repeats mm -hmm. and they've all got slightly different meanings, but I like those two struck me. Yes, there's a lot in that, in that fifth paragraph in particular um, to think about. Did anyone else, we can move to other places, but did anyone notice anything else in that section um, that they'd like to comment on? Who was that? I like the um, unfold and enfold um, that image and just it felt like using that play on words really, uh, brightness, unfold and enfold, nothing until you're feeling speaking one instant, but there's just something that you, it made it very clear, um, even though they sound so much alike, how how different those two words were, and that mm -hmm. I just felt that um, I love that idea of unfolding and unfolding. Mm -hmm. I'm going to keep us focused on that one spot <laughs> just while we're here. Um, to me, I mean, one of the reasons that I selected this piece for us to think with. Um, 
today is this idea of a story as a series of steps that we take. Um, and this is quite an incredible sentence. And it's um, there's a lot that's happening in this piece with pace and rhythm with some very short bursts and then some incredibly long, um, you know, layered sentences. But I'm just going to read this one again because I think it's worth um, a bit of emphasis. A story does not become something until it ends, until I pretend it's over and that I am no longer experiencing a walk on Grand Street early in the morning. Pretend these words, one after the other, are something like steps. Mine, yours, anybody's, anyone who listens, reads for some reason, and perhaps may remember steps, streets, and revisits how a morning materializes from nothing, but step after step taken while darkness, brightness, unfold and enfold, nothing until you are feeling, speaking one instant, one word after another, the next step seeming to follow from the one before, no beginning or end, more steps, more streets seeming maybe never to stop, materializing as fast and as solid as missing things suddenly recalled, things striking you as happy, painful, familiar, odd, urgent, but soon enough, you also recall that nothing's there. You are always as al always alone. You are alone as always with your thoughts, always alone, even with a busy head full of them, including anybody else's thoughts, aches, telling stories, pretending time at your fingertips, time ahead as you take step after step along grand. And where, oh, where else could you be? Where are you headed this morning, if not to a physical therapy appointment at 450 Grand Street and two young people appear together, content, focused enough on each other to match strides, colored teenagers or very young adults coming towards you, crowns of soft light, outlining hair rising above their skulls, light visible against morning's brightness, a shimmering that perhaps is source or end or both a vast brightness above them, surrounding them. But when I glance up and notice them, the word morning somehow came to mind. Woo. <laughs> that is, um, it's something. I didn't even realize that that was like all one sentence actually until I read it there. Um, but this idea of a, a walk being a story and a story is one word after another that we assemble in the same way with directions that we can take on different paths and that we can take the same walk and see it a completely different way and experience it completely differently with different feelings, right? I mean, there's so much to me that was, it's just such a powerful um, lens to think about the cities that we live in and how we experience them and experience them differently and also the stories that we tell and what we see and don't see. Um, what else, before, I, before we continue, I wanna spend a few more minutes. What are some other moments um, that caught your ear or your eye? Amy, you're muted. Oh, and Susan, you have, okay. We'll do, we'll do Susan first, just her and then Amy. Um, okay, so I took a, a fragment from the first paragraph. Um, strides synced, not hurrying, not strolling either. So I think, you know, it's the physical description. There's so much abstract description in this piece, but yeah. the physical description is pretty amazing also. Mm -hmm. and, um, and whoever read this did a great job because it was a tricky sentence. As if the something words make of nothing is time so that whole i i i can't say i totally understand what he was saying about time <laughs> but it was important to him <laughs> yeah i mean i know and then he jumps in time within the story yes so, oh, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> yeah yeah definitely this is i mean the title is important to recall here too art of story mm -hmm. um Amy, you were were you going to add something? Sorry, I had trouble unmuting. Mm -hmm. um, yes, the it, there's a repeated phrase, especially in the third paragraph, as if. 
um, that really struck me because of the sense of contingency. Believe as if time, not a word like others you make up to tell a story once upon a time, as if time might end or begin, as if time waits in a story and it goes on. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, how time works in stories and how we as writers control that time, right? And there's a sense of ownership of that, of that imaginary time in whatever story that we're composing, step after step, word after word. Uh, well, I would just stop short by the in the second paragraph where the first sentence is stories are graves. After we go mm -hmm. through this beautiful, you know, this sort of description of we think we're going to have these two people and something about two people on the street. And then it's just there's something so blunt about that. Yeah. And about that paragraph, which is full of very short um, sentences that then he loses his verbs and everything. And then and then we go back into the fluid. I liked what you said about you know, that there's this pacing in it, um, yeah. and each paragraph has its own pa pace, but that just felt like, whoa, what the stories are graves. Um, yeah. you know, so it makes you, it's like, it's like tripping over a, a gravestone and walking down the street. Right, yeah. I mean, anyone wanna take a stab at what's happening there in that um, second paragraph and with this idea that stories are graves? I mean, there is, as I think someone else noted, there's, quite a bit of abstraction in this piece. And then there's quite a bit of incredibly precise imagery. And I think one of the reasons that this piece works is because of the combination of the two. Um, but it's worth spending some time thinking about both. So if we wanna talk about this at the abstract level, I think, Fern, were you um, motioning there? Yeah. I mean, when I read that, it really, I mean, at first you're sort of like, it's a, it's a little bit depressing, right? Like everything you, you've written is dead, right? It's already happened. Mm -hmm. um, and that's sort of like, huh, okay, <laughs> why bother? <laughs> um, but then he says, you know, all living and dying in them fake pretend, but no story unless someone reads tells it. And suddenly you remember that that is what brings things alive is the telling of the story. Uh, and all of those stories, it seems he's saying exist, but you writer have to tell them to bring them to life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's right. It's this, uh, the gr imagery of grave and death juxtaposed with actually something that's a testament to the power of story is um, really powerful. Yeah, Thatcher. Um, that's something that was really striking to me all over this, um, is the continual, um, it's not quite a, a warping, but the very precise transformation and, and perhaps in some ways stunting of traditional rhythm and syntax, mm. that's a good point. which I think is being used to, to affect a kind of um, opposition between, let's say, you know, a story as a grave and, you know, enlivening physical detail, as well as the ability to abstract from and then return to life in front of you and to be able to do it not through one walk down a street and then a second walk down the street, but in the same moment during the same walk. Mm -hmm. Um, and the way in which that opposition is sustained by the plenitude of detail yeah. within a city, wherein what occurs is not just one's continual distraction from the matter at hand or from one's own life and one's return to the matter at hand but also a deeper and more confusing situation in which one is living in a world that one must narrativize in order to live and move forward while at the same time that world continually resists it, which I think is in part why 
addiction is constantly kind of crumbling around mm-hmm. itself. Hmm. Yeah, thank you. No, there's, I mean, I just to go um, to one part, I mean, there's this to return to what you were talking about, the level of detail and the specificity of the moment. Um, I want to talk about that before we move move on to working ourselves with our own words and steps. Um, let's just take a look at the imagery that is um, created, because in addition to thinking about time and how time works in stories um, and how we control as writers the narrative organization, um, we have images. We just have really beautiful, stark imagery. Did anyone note, and I see here from Susan, um, the glow above their heads, the aura. Um, There's a motif in a way in the piece that we return to a few times. Um, Did anyone else note those images specifically or have anything to say about them? We can look at the language because I think it's important to see how these images, um, this one image really, um, two young people, this is how we begin, right? Two young people, different colors, my color, crown of her top, not edges of his fro, glow softly down and they're walking down the street. So this is the first opening image. And then where do we get it again? We leave this image and we return to it. Uh, where is it? In the fifth paragraph. It's like in the fifth one where it's like tops of heads glowing, perhaps ready to explode. Is that the one you're referencing? Is that the next instance? Or I think there's one before. There's, oh, okay. there's in the fifth paragraph, we return again, actually before the end, right? To mm-hmm to strides, colored teenagers or very young adults, crowns of soft light, outlining hair rising above their skulls. So we have the same, there's there's a repetition, which I think is really important for how this piece works and holds together. Um, And then we come back, the glow, the aura is seeping from or hovering above the heads of two young people. And then we leave New York and go to Johannesburg and we come back again at the end. Um, I mean, that's the, that image stayed with me. I think in addition to the idea of steps and stories, that imagery of the light and the, and the heads walking, um, it's so singular and specific and it complements this completely abstract and almost baffling discussion of time and space and stories. Um, Anyone else have any other sentences? Let's see, we see here in the chat. Um, Yes, and that's the one other, the helicopter gun ships stitching a dark net in air above the square. I mean, that um, a dark net, helicopters stitching a dark net above the air is pretty um, amazing as a as an image. Any other lines or sentences before we move forward? I'm curious just thinking about some of the things that you've referenced more recently around like uh, different colors my color past me. Um, I'd be curious to get your thoughts on like how he positions himself within the story that he's also telling. Cause I feel like um, so much of what he's doing here is also kind of like in communication with himself and like his position and in time and space. Mm-hmm. Um, so I was just curious to see if you have any thoughts on that as well. In terms of how he's, how he is the narrator is seeing. Yeah, and then also people. like in kind of positioning himself and like highlighting like other specific people but then also making it as though everything is also blended in one Mm -hmm. um so like I know that we did highlight different colors like my color past me but I think in that same paragraph he says like a sky finally no color all color same 
different as the glow I'd seen floating atop their heads. Um, and then when he's talking about Cape Town, he's like, uh, I didn't copy the um, section correctly, but it's like top of heads glowing, perhaps mm -hmm. ready to explode and incinerate the million or so fuzzy bodies indistinguishable from one another of a crowd mm -hmm. ready to like greet uh, Nelson Mandela. And I thought that was really interesting as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think one of, so we don't, we see, we, we in terms of, it's interesting to think about his position as a narrator. We, he doesn't tell us immediately who he is or what he's doing, except um, let's see, we have that there, these two people are walking towards him, right? He sees them and they're walking towards him. Um, and all we know ultimately is that he's walking to a physical therapy appointment, <laughs> right? So that's completely like wonderfully ordinary errand that one does in the city, right? And he has this moment. And I think, I mean, so much of this, um, there's an interior kind of dialogue going on. And I think that, that that's what I hear. Um, and I maybe think you're getting at when you think about his position. And that's where this, um, trigger to another time and place comes in, right? And we are transported or, and with him because he's transported and seeing this image to another place. He's reminded of this moment 30 years prior. Um, it, in reading this, I think we see that time as a subject, um, it's not linear in this story, right? We um, are here on a street in New York and then immediately, instantly, we go back to a different place and then we return to this moment in New York. And I think that, um, so there's a commentary on time at the same time that time is being played with over the course of the narrative. And what links the pieces we may is, perhaps geography, if we want to think of that. We're in New York and then Cape Town. Um, and I think that to me is also part of what makes this interesting to think of as when we think about cities, um, how the city plays a part in all of our stories, either as background, but also as kind of capturing these important um, defining moments in our lives, right? And how a momentary glimpse of two people walking by can transport us to this historic moment. Um, we don't know anything about him except that- yeah. Well, we do, we do. Where does it say? The very first sentence says, two people, different colors, my color. Right, yes. And yeah. then he talks later in the piece, uh, uses the word colored which has yeah. a very specific meaning in South Africa. Yes, where is that moment? Um, let me see. Is that... It's There's a couple places, I think, but there's one, um, okay. So when he's walking on to his appointment at 450 Grand, colored teenagers or very young adults coming towards you crowds, crowns of soft light. But mm -hmm. then there's one that also places it at the very end in South Africa, mm -hmm. um, vanishing past two young colored strangers. Remember the square in Cape Town, the teeming excited crowd right. in which maybe I last saw them. So there's an echo of what he saw, the colored people he was with in the square in South Africa. Um, and this young couple he's passing right. in New York, remind, bringing that all back like his Madeline moment. Right, and it begins as it ends, which is mm -hmm. brilliant, right? To bring us back to the beginning. Um, all right, any last thoughts before we are now going to put pen to paper or words to computer screens? Um, any, all right. Um, what I'd like us to do, so I think there's, um, we're not going to write our own flash fiction in quite this capacity, but we're going to use um, the bones of this story. We talk about buildings and cities having bones, and I think we can talk about stories having bones as well, um, with image, place, and memory being the um, essential bones of this piece. 
what I'd like everyone to do, and I'll write this in the chat as well after I explain it, is to um, generate an image um, in, that comes to your mind, something you saw, it can be real, it can be fake, um, an outside image, a glance that you'd like to bring to life on the page. Um, it can be, you can also, it can be one or two or three images if you're not sure, but I want, in the same way that we have, we open with two young people, um, light on their, you know, for him, light on the top knot and the fro. Um, let's come up with our own images, concise, precise, thinking about color and shape. Um, in your, in a recent excursion or walk. If you have questions, I'm here and you can type in the chat, but um, we're gonna spend just a couple minutes, not too long, bringing that image. It could be an image of people, it can be an object, something. We're talking and we're thinking about, you know, a few sentences, no more at most. It doesn't matter where this happened yet. So don't worry about locating this image. Just think about the image itself. And perhaps the feeling that it registered. Take two more minutes. And if you've finished, you can conjure another image.
right? As you, we're gonna continue. Um, we're not gonna think about where this image occurs. I want you to specify a location and think about a specific location. This can be a particular street, a particular address, a room, a public park, but a very, but a particular one, right? I think this is something we have particular times and dates and places here. Again, this can be real or imagined, but let's um, think about where this image exit lives and how you would define the boundaries of it. take some time can writing is rewriting and erasing and scribbling right so crosswords out rewrite as we go And the last piece of this, as we go, um, I want you to identify a past moment, a memory, personal memory, that this image makes you think of. And give yourself some time to come to that. Um, we're going to bring this memory to life and we'll take a few minutes here um, where are you? Who else is there? What do you see most immediately?
And let's take one more minute, two more minutes, just to conclude our memory and take a look over these three parts. All right, finish the sentence, the words, the steps that you're taking. Now, will anyone share? a bit, if not the whole, I'd love to hear the whole, but if there's a bit that you are willing to share with us, either aloud or in chat, um, we can see each other's images and memories. Yeah, Thatcher. Um, I can just read it. Great. Um, do you want any background or anything, or should I just? Um, whatever, if you want to frame it for us briefly, that would be great. Sure. Uh, okay. Uh, I took a walk down to a convenience store last night because I've gotten in a really unhealthy habit of eating cheeseburgers at like midnight. <laughs> uh, and it's across from a public school. And then I kind of turned that into a memory where I was, um, kind of uh, robbed, but I didn't have any money and I felt very bad. So I bought the guy a pack of cigarettes. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, oh, I, tr I tried to kind of replicate the, some of the syntactical yeah. stuff. Great. So apologies if that's ridiculous. Um, learning across from computers that gave down to the gum spots to the cigarettes stubbed out while waiting for coffee and the eyes on the inner palm, the glow of learning. And not the night, but soft from the slab of learning, public school, on the gypsum steps in the empty lot, across from the quick stop, that lot, where students grow old and yes, old and young and sweats and sometimes the angry clothes that speak to when I was robbed without money and learning, bought cigarettes with a credit card and gave him only one pack because he could not hurt me. Nice, thank you. I like that last line. <laughs> um, Fern. Tree after street tree, suddenly in bloom. Too white, then a pink, like puffs of cotton candy at the end of twisted branches. Stepping beneath a canopy of white, the wind blows ever so slightly. White petals fall like snowflakes as I pass beneath. My dog looks up as flowers fall gently on his snout. He sneezes. When I turn down 51st Street, it's warm the unseasonably strong sun suddenly beating down on my face and neck. I feel as if something is missing, but can't place it. I look instead to what is there, row homes with porches tilted askew, paint peeling exteriors. I turn onto the next block and find myself standing next to the oak tree. 
sorry, I turn myself, I turn onto the next block and find my eight-year-old self standing next to the oak tree in our front yard in the suburbs, climbing it, picking off so many cicada ghosts. Mm, thank you. That was great. Bayan, thank you. Can we have one more? A bit? Yeah, Alyssa? All right, it's, it's Alisa. Alisa, sorry. That's okay. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, yeah, I'll read, I'll think I'll read the whole thing. Um, I'm not sure how connected it gets, but we'll see. I finished my run with a ragged sprint under a darkening sky and cooled by strengthening winds. Bright only moments before, the shadows have faded to leave gray sidewalks. There's a man with a giant marker tagging a building. He has on a white baseball jersey, a fitted cap, an Irish paleness, and a small black tattoo under his left eye. Petals from the swaying street trees swirl around him. How far did you run, he asks. This brick building takes up the entire block. Um, it's three stories high. A tattoo shop is on the street level and who knows what's above. There are no trees on this short section of the block, which is bisected by a street side street. But on the other side are pink blossom cherry trees dropping petals like a sneeze. I'm running in a park in Condesa in Mexico City, this time with ragged breath because my lungs are battling the thinner air in this high up city. A breeze shakes the trees. A dog trainer has 10 dogs of all different sizes lined up a foot apart, all facing him. Their leash is laid out in front of them. Great. I love that. I'm thinking about I like uh, the black tattoo under his eye. Somehow that like bit just was, uh, I mean, there's so much there, but thank you. That was great. We have time for one more actually. Amy. Small curled with sharp tips, mottled brown, magenta red tan, melting the surrounding snow, creating a tiny clearing in which to grow. Some fully emerged, hooded spathes curled involute, holding in the heat, an oval spadex studded with petalous flowers. At the side of a path, a vernal pond cordoned off. Anyone could jump over the rope, but most park goers will will respect the request to protect the fragile ecology with signs asking dog owners to control their pets. The plants live 20 years. So the plants I see are the children of those I first saw when I was nine years old with my new friend who stopped being my friend when I was in sixth grade and started down a bad kid path. She had narrow feet like royalty, she said. Mine are more peasant-like, suitable for exploring a swamp. Wow, <laughs> <laughs> that's cool, a swamp. Yeah, thank you. Anyone else? I don't wanna stop us. I was, um, well, thank you. Thank you all um, for coming and for joining us. Um, and I was just, you know, I'm continuing. I, I find this piece that we began with um, just sort of dazzling in so many ways, but I was thinking about this question of who the narrator is and how, and I think we do see and learn about him as the piece goes as well in the same way that we did with your stories based on how he responds to what he's seeing, right? And so we see that he's colored like some or one, both of the people walking. I think we get the sense that he's a different generation, right? That they're young and he's not young. Um, and that he, there's a sense of hope and that he associates with them and their youth that he is sort of struggling to sort of 
hold on to perhaps. Um, but I think that that's, it's, it's one of the layers of this that I, um, you know, you, you see it after the fact a bit that you learn who he is through what he sees and how he interprets what and who he sees on the, in this moment. And I think good stories, um, especially where there's a narrator's voice in this, in a first person narrator's voice where the I is present, but not too present, right? He comes and we can think about this in our own work about how to bring ourselves um, make ourselves present on the page without an overwhelming use of I, but instead bringing that subjectivity in through the interpretations that we see. Um, anyway, that's a parting thought. Um, I will, we have two more minutes if anyone wants to chime in um, with any other thoughts, but um, if not, we can conclude this hour. And um, I thank you all for coming and sharing and thinking and writing with me. Thanks. Thank you. That was wonderful. Great. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Have a great evening, guys. Thank you. you too. All right. That was so good. Thanks. Yeah, that went well. People.